So welcome to everybody to the Nutri Centre and a great thanks to the Nutri Centre for putting on the talk tonight. I'm going to talk about gluten and celiac disease. I've started doing a PhD on this so I'm looking at specific things but we're going to do a broad brush and look at how it's affecting the body. I'm Diane Shepperson Mills, I run the Endometriosis and Fertility Clinic and I'm a governor of ION and I'm a trustee of the Endometriosis She Trust and I trained in nutrition at Manchester University and then I did an OU degree in educational science and then I was at ION for three years and then I've done an MA in health education nutrition looking at fertility and nutrition and that's what led me looking at gluten and celiac because it does affect a lot of people so is this going to work? I ha I've not got my pointer pen tonight, so can you all read that? <coughs> celiac disease is linked to many other disorders, from what the research is showing. Ataxia, epilepsy, migraines, osteoporosis, depression, dermatitis herpiformis, diabetes type 1, infertility, autoimmune diseases, thyroid diseases, Sjogren's syndrome, Addison's disease, autoimmune liver disease, cardiomyopathy, alopecia, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, abscess stomatis, multiple sclerosis, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, Raynaud's syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, lactose intolerance, irritable bowel syndrome, anemia. This is from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And there's a lot of good research at Columbia University coming out looking at exactly how celiac disease is manifesting and triggering other autoimmune problems. So we're going to look at all of that. Now we know gluten's a protein in wheat. How many of you have made bread? Not many, but some. When you're, you're making bread and you knead it and you leave it to rise, the gluten's the stretchy protein part that traps the gas bubbles. And it's responsible for a celiac disease diagnosis. And we know that 1% of the American population, that's 1 in 100 people when you test them, are celiac, are coming up as diagnosed as celiac. It used to be 1 in 2,500, so it's obviously through the generations spreading its wings. Gluten damages the villi in the small intestine. In your small intestine, You've got lots of finger-like projections which increase the surface area for absorption. And what the gluten does is it destroys them eventually. It eats them away. And even when you talk to pathologists, they say on autopsy, lots of people have got damaged villi. So once they're eaten away, and the inside of the small intestine has no longer got lots of surface area for absorption. You're reducing absorption areas and you've got inflammation being set up. So a lot of people fall ill because they're not taking in the nutrients they need. And a lot of them get weight loss, but some people put weight on. So weight loss isn't necessarily a, the only given thing. And a lot of people bloat, particularly when it's diagnosed in little children. They look as though they've got quashiorkor with little spindly arms and big tummies and they're having lots of diarrhea. So the symptoms, well, many, as you've seen. It's the most commonly underdiagnosed hereditary autoimmune condition. Celiac disease is not a food allergy and it's not a food intolerance. It's a hereditary condition that you have the genes for, as it were. And it, as we've seen, it triggers lots of illnesses. I mean, people can get a myriad of symptoms. Burping, 
extreme gas, what I call distension as opposed to bloating, irritable bowel syndrome, abdominal discomfort, bowel cancers are linked to it, heartburn, diarrhea, constipation, weight loss, poor growth, foul smelling stools, malaise, weakness, and lactose intolerance can be triggered because the villi are damaged. So you go to the doctor and it's a very difficult <laughs> thing for the doctor to work on because you, you could have all sorts of things. So the umbrella term irritable bowel syndrome covers everything. And unless you come up positive for a gluten sensitivity blood test or the full blown biopsy of the small intestine villi, it's very difficult to diagnose. And at the moment, you know, a lot of doctors will just take the gold standard biopsy. But in America now, they're testing more and more with a blood test to look if your auto antibodies are reacting to gluten and gliadin. Now, this is the interesting thing. Wheat farming only started 10,000 years ago. In fact, I got up early this morning to make a cup of tea and lo and behold, on the farming program in the morning, they were talking about a £7 billion project they've just started on growing wheat around the world. Now there are seven, when you look at the books on wheat, the big mighty toads, there are 70,000 forms of wheat, seeds, different types. So there are lots of varieties, but of course like modern farming, they farm a few of them, not lots. But it's a relative new food to man. You know, we've been here for ages and ages and we only really started growing, farming in agriculture with wheat about 10,000 years ago. So in Britain, when you talk to hunter-gatherer experts, they say that in Britain here, we only started using wheat in the Middle Ages and then that was the very wealthy people. But before that, we ate acorn flour, bulrush, and lupin flour. So we ate lots of other alternative carbohydrate sources. And very interestingly, Peter Darmo, he's suggesting blood type O people have more difficulty digesting the gluten in the wheat which is an interesting thing. He says the gluten in the wheat germ interferes with type O metabolic processes. So it may be that our digestive enzymes for the gluten are not as good as other people's, but I don't know whether that's been tested properly. So incidence first occurs up to the age of three in little people, where they get all the diarrhea and the bloated tummy. But there is, oh, and um, yes, the bloating, stunted growth, because of course you're malabsorbing your nutrients. And then the second peak that starts in people's 30s, where they start being ill from wheat. And then when you talk to the celiac disease in Eastbourne, the society there, they're getting lots of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s being diagnosed. So something's obviously changing and it's becoming more common which we don't want it to be now i didn't get the graph of this but there is a grass family these are all grasses and the one problem we have is if the bees die out these are the only foods we'll have because we'll have no fruit and veg so we need to get the bees going so it's the grass family graminae and there are two arms of the graminae. The first one, one is festu sodia. I can't say it, I'm at the wrong angle here. Festu sodia, the subfamily. And in that subfamily, you've got wheat, barley, rye, oats, and rice on the first branch of the arm. Tritici is the wheat, horidins are barley, secolins are in the rye, Avidins are in the oats, and Arises in the rice. So those are the subsections, if you like, of the first arm of the family. The second arm is Panisodia. I 
can't say that one either. Pan panisodia, the maize, millet and sugar. They're on the second arm. The maize, the corn is trypsia. The millet is panacea. And that has prolamines in. And prolamines have a similar antigenic activity to the alpha gliadin of wheat. So some people who are very sensitive to gluten may react to millet. And I have questions about cane sugar, although we don't eat, eat the actual head of the cane sugar. It is in that grass family, and I wonder if some of the problems people have with sugar is from this reason. The non-grasses, the buckwheat, which has a very silly name really, I wish it wasn't called wheat, people get confused, but buckwheat is rhubarb family, and that has the prolamines in as well. So some people who are very sensitive might be upset by millet and buckwheat if they are extremely gluten sensitive. <coughs> so you have to be careful because usually you think, well, they're safe. They're not, you know, as close to wheat. But the very, very sensitive people may react. Yes. No, I haven't put it on there, but um, it's coming up in a minute. Spelt is a medieval wheat, so it's still the same form of gluten gliadin that the wheat is, but it's a medieval form, you know, so it's not been changed as much. So the gluten in wheat endosperm is composed of two proteins, the gliadin and the glutenin. And they've definitely shown that the gliadin portion can activate celiac disease. And as I've said before, the rye, the barley and oats, they're prolamines as well. But oats, a lot of people seem to be able to cope with. It's not as harmful. So the closer to the wheat on the family tree, the more likely they are to affect a celiac. Whereas the further away they are, if we go back one, the maize, millet and sugar are less likely to affect people. So these are what are called storage proteins. They're storing the protein for the seed head, for the seed to grow if it's planted again. And there are 18 forms of gluten. So it's not just the one gluten, gliadin, gluten is. There are actually 18 forms. And you've got the spelt is the same as wheat, triticum. Triticale is triticum, camut is triticum, and malt is saccharum. So you've got all these different families of gluten which affect people at different levels. Corn has zeanines in rise the rhizal and pansium in the minute the prolines now this was interesting rice and maize the corn do not appear to activate celiac disease but further on you'll see there's some area where it says that rice can affect some people but usually people seem to be safe with rice and maize now gliadin's the problem molecule it shares an amino acid sequence with adenovirus number 12, which may predispose to the onset of disease near the time of an infection. But again, cause and effect hasn't been proven. And adenoviruses are a group of DNA-containing viruses that cause infections in the upper respiratory tract, producing symptoms like the common cold. And it's a single polypeptide with a high level of glutamine and proline and it breaks down into four electrophoric factors alpha beta gamma and omega so there is some relationship where it may cause respiratory problems and as we know if you look back into olden times when we had millers in windmills it's well known that bakers had asthma eczema. They used to very often get asthma and eczema because they were surrounded all day by wheat dust and flour. So that may be one of the links. 
glutenins are the other form of storage protein and they're associated with autoimmune skin diseases and certain types of asthma. And the digestive digestion of these storage proteins requires specific digestive enzymes which many people with celiac disease appear to lack. So the glutenin peptides, these proteins, like I always imagine them like popper beads. When I was a little girl, you had different coloured beads you could pop together, a bit like yellow. And if you've got a whole protein, you've got a very long length of chain of these beads. But if it's a peptide, it's just a small group of these beads. And if it's an amino acid, it's just a single bead. So you have these peptides forming in certain ways that can activate the T lymphocyte immune cells in the small intestine in the same way as gliadin. So the question was posed, is glutenin also involved in the disease process? Because at first they didn't think it was in the same way. But glutenin reacts with elastin, which is a stretchy elastic tissue in the skin, the epithelial tissue. So glutenins, they think, may also play a role in autoimmune disease because they found that glutenin peptides are toxic to cells. So if they put a petri dish of human tissue and they put some glutenin in it, the glutenin kills off the cells. So it's all new research, but it's showing a lot of changes to what we thought. So the glutenin antibodies appear to cross-react with rice, which may place rice off limits for some people who are very sensitive to gluten. So although, you know, we often think millet, rice and buckwheat are safer, for some people who are extremely sensitive to gluten, they also may be a problem we need to watch over that. Gliadin is not a toxic component. Tests have exclusively identified antibodies sensitized to gliadin that appear to be inadequate for identifying everyone who is gluten sensitive. So they're thinking that it's not just the gliadin but the glutenin is also a problem for people. And they look at IgG and IgA anti-glutenin immunoassays as a blood test to look if you're reacting to gluten. And if you are, then they can do a biopsy and check if that is the correct diagnosis. There are also globulins and albumins within the wheat and the gluten. But they've not looked at those in such depth, so they don't know whether they're causing the same problems. And then you've got lectins, which contain defensive proteins that specifically bind to carbohydrates. And the markers on each cell in the gut wall of celiacs may have these markers, these carbohydrate markers and the leptin in the wheat can bind to those. They're determined genetically, which is where the genetic link comes in. And the theory is that celiac people with true celiac disease have inherited particular marker molecules and their father on the surface of their cells, which is bound to the leptin in the gluten. So the combination of lectin and marker to the your immune system or a celiac's immune system looks like some alien invader. So your body immediately starts. Whereas somebody who isn't celiac and doesn't have those markers can tolerate the wheat, rye, oat, barley. So it depends on your hereditary genes, really. David Lloyd George, he always said, don't be afraid to take a big step if one is indicated. You can't jump a chasm in two steps. So if people think that there's a problem where they're getting diarrhea, constipation, whatever, you need to go to the doctor.
doctor and sort out what it is, get a diagnosis, because coming off wheat can be a bit terrifying in our world, because a lot of foods are based on wheat, but it's not, not so difficult as it used to be. So it's not such a big chasm as it used to be. There's a lot of help. So we've got this immune system war going on. If you have problems with wheat gluten, your immune system is waging war. And it's relentless because people eat it every day. It's in all our diet. It's a staple food. It's called the staff of life. It's something we've you know, developed as a major food. So your antibodies and the bound lectin, it can cause severe damage to the gut lining and these villi are eaten away. So your small intestine, instead of being healthy and doing its job properly and helping you absorb nutrients and produce immunoglobulins, you know, and B vitamins and vitamin K, it all goes haywire and you start major malabsorption. Now, once you're into major malabsorption, the rest of your body is going to crumple. It's like dominoes, because each part of your body needs nutrients. And if they're not going in, your nervous system, your reproductive system, your kidneys, everything will be at a loss because it's not getting the nutrients it needs to work properly. But it can be risky for celiacs to experiment with eating gluten, James Braley says, because if you've avoided it for some years and you seem fully recovered and then you eat a little bit, you can go into an acute reaction called celiac shock, even with a small amount. And you have to be careful. I remember when I was teaching at school, a lot of the children I had couldn't were celiac and couldn't eat wheat you know and it's very difficult i mean the, the, these were in the 70s and 80s it was almost impossible you know in those days there was no there were no rice cakes it was just very very hard but even if you drip feed if you're very sensitive it can cause a problem and it's difficult to stay off because it's in lots of things it's hidden so suppression of immune function, what we think of as the staff of life, for some people isn't the staff of life. So this alpha gliadin, the molecule, the protein, has demonstrated immune suppressing activity in celiac patients. And this is why they seem to develop all these other disorders, autoimmune diseases. But it has no effect in a healthy control. So a person who hasn't got the genes are fine. It may be the result, they say, of decreased vitamin and mineral absorption, especially vitamin A and the carotenoids. And there's increased malignant cancers seen in celiac people, patients, one should say. The other thing one looks at is the opioid activity of the wheat because wheat gluten components demonstrate an opioid like an opium like activity and there is an association between wheat consumption and schizophrenia and the hypothesis is that gluten is a causative factor in the development of some schizophrenias not all of them but some of them and it's been substantiated in epidemiological clinical and experimental studies but a lot of times it's not taken note of in medical areas. Endorphins are natural opiates. If you're on a field of war or you're in a bus crash and your arm's severed or whatever, a lot of the soldiers and people in accidents don't know that they're badly injured because your body's brain produces endorphins that help you feel fine and get you through this immediate trauma. So endorphins are a natural opiate that our brain produces and there is some research showing that vitamin B1 is important in keeping that system working. The brain cells have receptors for these molecules. 
And when these endorphins that we're producing in our brain bind to the brain cell, feelings of pain are suppressed. And you feel well. There are four or five different endorphin receptors which all have different effects. Morphine and the opiates that we're given after an operation to suppress pain have the same natural effect. So you, we use morphine and opiates as painkillers. Like they did, all the poets use them. Exorphins. Now, endorphins are naturally produced in your brain to kill pain. But they're saying that there are these things called endorphins. Now, endorphins are peptides, again, protein, B, little chains, of amino acids. And it, as the food's digested in the small intestine, these amino acids are broken down to single amino acids and then they're sent around the body to your cells who build them up in another way to another amino the body needs to use. Some of the peptides are similar to endorphins and they're known as exorphins, exogenous morphic molecules. And in labs, with X, they've produced them from wheat and dairy and maize and barley using human digestive enzymes. So they've shown that they exist and that when they're in an experiment, they actually produce exorphins using human digestive enzymes. And they bind to the natural receptors of endorphins. So they follow the path of endorphins and create this sense of well-being. So they have to breach the gut wall, however, to get inside the bloodstream. They can't just go in there because the villi, you know, are protective. But if you've got a leaky gut, if you've got candida and yeast overgrowth, or if you're celiac and you're undiagnosed and you're reacting to gluten and the villi are being destroyed, you're going to have a leaky gut membrane. So these sides, these exorphins, can get through to the bloodstream. The, I've put that, the endorphins, the ones that the brain produces, have a structure at one end which stops enzymes attacking them. But the exorphins do that structure, so they can be broken down. So the question is, do these exorphins have an effect in the body? <coughs> do they affect mood? Is that the part that's causing mood problems? And we know that foods create a sense of well-being. We all have comfort foods. When we all had medicine as a little child, Mummy didn't say, here you are, have a carrot and a stick of celery. You were given a sweet or some chocolate to take the nasty flavour away. And we all think of chocolate and sweets for birthdays, Christmas, anniversaries, Easter. And we associate it with happy times. So when we're feeling glum and down, you go for a comfort food. You don't go for a stick of celery. You go for the thing you associate with a happy time. And people do crave chocolate, sugar and bread. In food intolerant people, they always say, crave the food that's doing them the most harm. And the food contains the peptides which can have other effects in the body. So the susceptible people with the genetic predisposition to developing celiac disease may be deficient in some enzymes and become vulnerable to the effect of exorphins. So that's um, the complete guide to food allergy and intolerance, Jonathan Brostoff, the immunologist. And people often report with wheat and gluten that they've got this excessive tiredness. Well, they're forced to because they're malabsorbing nutrients. They, you know, don't feel well. It's chronic fatigue syndrome, post-viral syndrome, <coughs> food intolerance, <coughs> immune system reactions, and it's felt that exorphins may play a part here. 
So you've got these gluten opioids. There are five distinct opioids contained in gluten. A4, A5, B4, B5 and C. And they're found repeatedly in the structure of single proteins. And the gluten exorphin A5 occurs at 15 sites in one single glutenin protein. So there's a lot of this stuff about in one single protein. You've got 15 sites where it can be cut and start reacting. But exorphins are less potent and viable in their strength to morphine. 0.5 milligrams of the most active exorphin is equal to one nanomolecule of morphine. And exorphins may be the determining factor in comfort foods. Because if you get used to a food and you feel really good after you've eaten it, which most people do with chocolate, then you might crave it because you like the feeling that the exorphin gives you after you've eaten it. So you want more. And cancers. This is my real worry with all of this as well. The immune system has the ability to destroy damaged cells. Potential to turn cancerous. So if your immune system works properly and it recognises a cell that may be cancerous or turning cancerous, your white blood cells and complement can go in and gobble it up, remove it, stop the damage before it spreads. So a good immune system that's working effectively will see a cancer and remove it. But with exorphins, they interfere with that defense mechanism. And it's the natural killer cell, the body's first line of defense against these cells that are beginning to mutate. And they act to identify and destroy those cells with altered chromosomes, the cells that can turn cancerous. And you've got altered spleen function, altered cell function also seen. And the opiated and opioids have been shown to interfere with the natural killer cells. So the exorphins can inhibit our ability to ward off cancer. They weakening the immune system and deregulate the natural killer cells so our body is less able to deal with cells on our epithelial tissues that are turning cancerous. And the time to assert full recovery from celiac disease, they say, is three to five years. And celiacs experience declining risk of malignancy when they go on to a gluten-free diet. So they're less likely to get a malignant cancer when they come off the gluten and celiac, the, the gluten, the wheat, the gliadin, the glutenins, once they come off, they're less likely to have a problem. So these exorphins and natural killer cells, there are two ways they work. The first way the exorphins act to deregulate natural killer cells is by abolishing the protective function of the natural killer cells and the opioid receptors on the cells that work against cancer. And that interference occurs 30 minutes of expo exposing blood from the celiac patients to the proteins from gluten. So it doesn't take long if you put the exorphins in with tissue for it to start affecting the natural killer cells. And the other, the second way endorphins, exorphins rather, interfere with the immune system is that they act indirectly through an area of the brain that activates the natural killer cells. This is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis which controls the activation of natural killer cells. So the gluten and its fractions, the gliadin and the glutenin, interfere with the way the immune system protects us from cancers or other diseases and autoimmune problems. So celiac disease and addiction is 
see if you like chocolate because you're, it builds up exorphins in you and it gives you a feel good I'm doing well factor does that become an addiction? Because sometimes you see people and they're having chocolate every day not just at birthdays and Christmas and the exorphins are biochemically similar to heroin, cocaine and morphine and undiagnosed celiacs and addicts have similar ways of behaving to food. The addicts experience powerful cravings. I know when I've been in some of the hospitals, they've got to have four teaspoons of sugar in very strong tea. And they love their bread and cakes. They like sweet things. Abnormal food cravings are commonly observed in gluten sensitive and food allergy sufferers and there's even pulmonary bleeding reported in both celiac disease and addiction and people have seen well researchers have seen lung abscesses and cavities reported in celiac disease and if people have got an opioid addiction so there is a lot more going on than meets the eye with just the celiac disease and there's obviously this chromosome damage. Both celiac disease patients and addicts have substantially higher rates of chromosome damage than the general population. So if you take someone who's not got celiac disease and you take someone who's got celiac disease, the people with celiac diagnosed diseases will have far worse chromosome damage. Both groups may be slow at repairing cellular DNA, the key element in the development of cancer. And people with celiac disease have been seen to have enlarged gastrointestinal lymph nodes, which can be misdiagnosed as lymphomas. So celiac disease is, is a pre-malignant condition, and it's associated conditions resolve when you go on a gluten-free diet. So this is deadly serious because there's a proportion of the population who should not be eating cereals like wheat, rye, oats, barley. And we need to find out who. I was reading in the book a bit earlier on that actually in Italy, of all places, with pasta and pizza, they are starting to test all six-year-olds for gluten, gliadin and gluten insensitivity, which I think would be a good idea everywhere. I don't even know whether six is the right age, but at least if you're testing them, you're going to find out how bad it is, and you'll be able to stop the damage before it gets ahead. I mean, that's what we ought to be looking <coughs> at, as this is getting worse and worse. When I was taught about celiac disease in the 70s, it was one in two and a half thousand people who were diagnosed with celiac disease, whereas now you've got one in a hundred adults and one in 60 children. So it's definitely filtering down. In Finland, there's one in 99. I remember to come from Savalina, wonderful place, to be recommended. They have an opera season in July and Lona and I had walked around the summer island <coughs> and as we got to the end of the walk you could smell beautiful cinnamony flavours emanating from this gingerbread cottage looking building and we went in and the lady served us with our tea and said would you like some cake and I said oh I can't I'm a celiac and she said oh this is no problem and she proceeded to produce this lovely almond flan with lemon and fruits and things. And I thought, oh, wonderful, because you, don't, you didn't find that in England. So Finland, the Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, those people are more likely to have this celiac gene. And it's in Celts, the Scots and the, the Irish. And it's also in Ashkenazi Jews. I remember at the ASRM meeting a few years ago, they were giving a talk on ageing. 
and they, I wish I had the slides, they had the slide of an old man who looked about 70, but he, he, they, were, they were Ashkenazi Jews, but in actual fact he was 100. And his son, who was 70, looked about 50. So it was very intriguing to see that. The genes also been found in people in South America, Canada, Australia, and for some reason, Sahara Desert peoples. They don't know why that little group have it compared to some of the others. And as I said, one in 100 adults and one in 60 children when you just take them at random and test. But 97% go undiagnosed for about nine, eight or nine years. And it's the delay in the diagnosis which is causing the autoimmune diseases. This morning, I didn't have time to watch, but they were talking, weren't they, on the news about doctors doing allergy skin prick tests to look at, you know, problems children were having with food, the true IgE allergy. But, and, and we know that we've now got the figures for Britain is 20 million people with allergies in Britain and 16 immunological clinics to deal with them. But celiac disease isn't an allergy and it's not an intolerance, it's hereditary and it needs looking at as well. So in America, they're saying it's this nine years to diagnosis, which everybody says is at least eight years too long. And for a child, it could be a third or half of its life span that it's had. And you do get this silent celiac disease, which is not always picked up because on some of the blood tests, there are false negatives and false positives. So parents have been told sometimes in America that the children will grow out of it. But you cannot grow out of celiac disease. It's hereditary, it's genes. And it can be masked or mistaken for other conditions. And there is in America, they're calling it non-celiac gluten sensitivity. They're saying 20% of the American population if they have a non-specific injury in the small intestine membrane to the villi and have a leaky gut membrane and increased levels of intestinal immune cells swishing about and elevated antibodies against gluten, then they're calling that condition non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I suppose the idea is that if the membrane's damaged, then maybe the gliadin and glutenins are getting through into the bloodstream and triggering something else to start the disease off, or a disease. So the onset of injury, there are environmental factors that may influence the timing of the onset of injury, as well as how severe the symptoms are going to be. And they suggest that the avoidance of wheat exposure in early infancy has been proposed as a protective factor. Now, I can remember when I was a baby, you had rusk. You teased on bits of bread and rusty, biscuity, crispy things. So you were given it at an early age. And breastfeeding infants have a delayed initiation of this intolerance compared to formula-fed infants. And there's research on breastfeeding showing that it appears to have a protective effect as breastfed babies have a decreased risk of developing celiac disease. Now what it doesn't tell me is how long, because some people breastfeed for about four months, some six, and was it last week or the week before? I don't know because time's going so quickly. They were saying that they should introduce solids earlier. But this is saying that you shouldn't, really. So an early introduction of cow's milk is also believed to be a causative factor. This is the Pediatric Journal of New um, from the Swedish Actia Pediatrics in Scandinavia. So research in the past few years has clearly indicated that breastfeeding along with delayed administration of cow's milk and cereal grains, may be protective 
against children developing lactose and celiac. You know, your, your membranes develop longer without it and they're stronger and more likely to resist. So we're saying there are these susceptible individuals with the genes. So you've got to have the specific genes to develop full-blown celiac. And what's interesting, 70% of identical twins, after one twin's been diagnosed with celiac, 70% of twins, where one's diagnosed with celiac, they both have it. And 10% of first degree relatives are found to be celiac. So the father, the mother, the brothers, the sisters, an aunt, an uncle. So if someone in your, someone in your close family is diagnosed as celiac, what should happen is that everybody in the family is tested, mum, dad, the three kids, if one child's diagnosed. So you should look for it in the first degree relatives, because it may be a silent celiac disease, but still doing nasty things inside. And we have this increased morbidity rate for people <coughs> with celiac disease. Research shows a statistical risk. If you're celiac and probably undiagnosed, you've got 33 times greater risk for small intestine adenocarcinoma. So you're more likely to develop cancers of intestine. You're at six times greater risk for esophageal cancer. 9.1 times greater risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 5 times greater risk for, me risk for melanoma, and 23 times for papillary thyroid cancer. So clearly, celiac disease is not good for your health, and the earlier it's diagnosed, the better. Lactose intolerance. Initially, when you're diagnosed with celiac disease, you eliminate often lactose dairy foods as damage to the villi can trigger a lactose intolerance. Often when you first diagnose with celiac, you have to come off dairy food. And then as the gut membrane heals, you can often go back onto dairy food because your gut membrane's healed and you're not reacting to the lactose. Because if you've got a damaged, inflamed, small intestine, mm. it's going to react to everything. You know, it's like when you've grazed your hand or your knee, you know, it's just going to react to whatever is coming past it. But what's our standard diet? Well, people have a wheat-based cereal for breakfast with some milk. Maybe some berries if you're lucky, some toast and jam, bread and jam, whatever. S sandwiches at lunch, maybe a chocolate covered biscuit. Go home and have pasta or pizza or salad, maybe a pudding with wheat. And snack during the day on cakes and biscuits and chocolates covered in wheat or wheat covered chocolates. So our diet now, from the 1950s, is vastly changed and people are eating a whole lot more wheat than we ever did. When I was a child, you may have had some bread for breakfast or some wheat of eggs, but at school you had a proper dinner with vegetables and potatoes and meat or fish or whatever. And then you came home in the evening and had some vegetable soup or something. Whereas now we're giving people an overload of wheat. And if you think back to hunter-gatherers, before farming, they might grind a bit of wheat up and make it between two stones and make a, a flour, but they wouldn't be having masses of it. So we've got a bigger challenge going on here. And you can do exclusion diets. And clinical improvement can be apparent within a few days or weeks. I had one husband brought his wife to me many years ago and she was violent and angry and Rrr! and I worked with her and I it, it, everything she said sounded like a wheat problem so I said let's come off wheat for two weeks and
and see what happens. And we put her on all the other grains so we weren't missing anything. And four days later, she rang me and said, Diane, it's like coming out of a thick fog into a clear blue sky. I feel like a totally different person. So some people respond within three days, 30%. 50% it's a month before they start coming out of it and 10% two months and then another 10% respond only after two, three years. It will depend on the amount of damage that's gone on in the gut. So that's um, food and nutrition and dietary therapy. So what, what do we want people to eat? Well we want nutrients above all else. We don't want lots of carbohydrates, sugars and fats. You want vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals going into your bloodstream. Because that's the only thing that keeps us healthy on a daily basis. So perhaps a fruit smoothie, some vegetable soup and chicken salad, fresh salmon salad, lemon sorbet, snacking on nuts and seeds and fruits. And I mean there's so much in the supermarket. Some of it perhaps not as good as we would like, but it's a lot better than it used to be. I can remember, I think I've put it up later on, when I was first diagnosed when I was 37, I used to walk around the supermarket crying. My heart, you know, it was so distinct, because the only thing I could go down was the fruit and vegetable aisle with the meat and fish. And I was in so much pain then, because I had endometriosis and I was ill, that if I wanted to get some of the gluten-free food, my husband had to lie me on the back seat of the car with bags of ice and drive up to Forest Row where there was Seasons, the only big health food shop that was outside of London. And we used to buy what I needed once a month there because it wasn't in the shops. And I had so many rice cakes, I now want to glue them to ceilings and emulsion them. Because <laughs> I, I lived on them for three years, there wasn't much else. Yes. So what do you do with a non-responder? If you take somebody off wheat for a cup, two to four weeks, and they don't respond, what's going on? Well, maybe it's an incorrect diagnosis. We go back to the drawing board and look at what else is happening and test them. Or it may be, that we've got a broom covered person who's hiding with a Mars bar in the corner or you know some chocolate coated wheat thing and they can't just can't not have it because their own ex-orphans are telling them you need it now or there's hidden sources like some yogurts have got modified starch in some lemonades have got flour in to make them look cloudy some of the corn tacos have got wheat in, even though it says they're corn. Some of the crisps have got wheat in, even though it says they're crisps, and some of the flavoured crisps. So you do have all of this hidden wheat. The programme, I can't remember whether it was Woman's Hour, but Radio 4 did a programme a couple of years ago on celiac disease, and a professor was answering the questions, and people were phoning in. And one man said, well, I have cornflakes. And the professor immediately said, well, that's no good because they've got malt on them from wheat. And the man had eaten them for years and didn't realise that he was having this drip, 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 drip exposure to wheat gluten. So it, it's hidden in so many things. It's startling. And even if you find a product... I can remember there was a woman in Liverpool, I think they made a film about her with several autistic children. Um, and Julie Walters took the role. And I can remember when it did the program on her, she, she was checking everything because she said one week, this is fine and there's no gluten or wheat in it or modified starch or maltodextrins or rust. But the next week, week it might have something in it. So she had to check all the time because the recipes changed. There's also an associated disease or complication like zinc deficiency. Because zinc's important for your cell membranes for collagen. 
So celiac disease could be unresponsive to dietary therapy if the person's zinc deficient. This is the annual review of nutrition and perspectives in celiac disease, Baltimore University Press. So we've got all these bits we know. We just need to bring it all together. So we've said Celts, Nordic peoples, Ashkenazi Jews. It's hereditary. And I'll skip through this bit. But it's the HLA, the human leukocyte antigens, which are proteins found on every cell in the body. And they patrol the immune system like sentries, like the soldiers outside Buckingham Palace. And Queen Victoria made them stamp so she could hear that they were there. They turned around. And these HLA genes identify self and non-self invaders. And the class that's involved with celiac disease are HLA class 2 DQ genes. And there's the DQ2 and the DQ8, which are active in celiac disease. I've got some handouts, so don't panic. <laughs> um, the eight, DQ2, 95% of people with celiac disease have the HLA DQ2. And I won't go into the rest, it's too complicated. And then the HLA DQ8, 5% of people with celiac disease have that one. So there is a way of identifying a genetic link. And the their role in development of genetically predisposed diseases like diabetes, type 1, celiac. And everybody's got different versions because you get one version from and one version from your dad. So everybody's slightly different. We're all unique. And they're used to show organ compatibil compatibility when you're having a transplant. And these genes, the DQ8, DQ2 and the DQ8, they predispose people to, an auto to getting an autoimmune disease if their immune system is not working properly. So you've got proteins on the lymphocytes. And the proteins on the surface of each white blood cell, each lymphocyte, is shaped with a groove, rather like an LP, where the needle goes round in the groove. And it interacts and binds gliadin. The gliadin goes in the groove. And the gliadin part of the protein gets into this mucosal lining of the intestine and does the damage. And gliadin is the alcohol-soluble part of the gluten. So what do we do? You have to see your GP. The lecture is going to highlight what we need to do, but essentially you need a proper diagnosis of gluten activity. So you need to read as much as you can. There's the website Celiac Center, spelt in the American way, er.org. The bidmc.harvard.edu and the Celiac Disease Center, again the American spelling, dot columbia.edu, the Columbia University one. So we have this delay in diagnosis, and this is the problem because then people are developing these awful autoimmune diseases where your body's attacking itself and you start getting even iller, if that can happen. Mm -hmm. And there are 2.1 two million people with type 1 diabetes in America, and 8 to 10% of those have been shown to have celiac disease as well. So autoimmune diseases, where your body is attacking itself, that affects 3% of the general population, the people who are well, don't have celiac disease. But it affects 30% of people with celiac disease. So there's this weakness in the immune system going off. And 30% of patients are diagnosed after the age of 20 years. So there's a lot of damage going on. Prolonged exposure, and they develop one autoimmune disease on average. So by the age of 20, you may have an autoimmune because you've been an undiagnosed celiac. And women, of course, not 
will three to one times more likely to get an autoimmune disease than men. Probably because our hormones are going up and down. They always use that as an excuse. Infertility, which is what brought me here, <coughs> men and women in America, 10% are having infertility problems. I hate to say they're infertile, they're subfertile. There's something not working properly. <clears throat> Unexplained infertility is in 20% of them. Endometriosis can be 40 to 60% of the women. <clears throat> and polycystic ovaries, tubal irregularities, and low sperm count. And if the man has got celiac disease, he has reduced sperm count. If the woman's got celiac disease, they have shorter bleeds and can go into premature menopause. So there are definite links with celiac disease and the reproductive system, also with osteoporosis. 75% of newly diagnosed patients with celiac disease have a degree of bone loss, what's called osteopenia. And it's the phytic acid as well. It's not just the gluten in wheat. There's phytic acid in wheat, which locks up calcium, magnesium, and zinc, so it can't be utilized to the body. The phytic acid binds to it, so you can't absorb calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron properly. So if you're eating all that wheat every day, and all that phytic acid every day, there's another reason you're malabsorbing as well as just the gluten, gliadin. And diarrhea in celiac patients triggers vitamin D malabsorption. And Fosamax and the other, what are they called, I've forgotten, the actinel, the bispheme or whatever, are given for osteoporosis, but they also have a propensity to damage the gut. My mum takes one of them on a Sunday morning. And we sit down, she puts the alarm on for 8.30, she has her uh, Fosamax, and then she's got to walk round for half an hour to help it digest through the massage gut as you're walking. Otherwise, people do get digestion problems diabetes. So 8 to 10 percent of patients with diabetes type 1 will develop celiac disease. The link's been known for 40 years and both are associated with the DQ2 and the DQ8 gene halotypes. Children with recently diagnosed celiac disease had a higher prevalence of anti- islet cell and anti-insulin antibodies than did children who were non-celiac. So already the immune system is doing its going on red alert. So and after going on a gluten-free diet, these children, the antibodies stop being developed and they go back to normal. I've just had a patient last week and she developed cardiomyopathy at 32. It's an inflammatory condition of a heart muscle. And there are three types, dilated, hydrotropic, sorry, hip, hypertropic, restrictive. And in celiac disease, the most common form is the dilated, the congestive cardiomyopathy. The heart muscle becomes inflamed and weakens and the heart can enlarge and the area, the tissue around the heart is inflamed. And you get arrhythmias, disturbance in the heart's electrical conduction scene. And autoimmune reactions against the heart is directed against transglutamase TTG present in the heart. And a gluten-free diet has been shown to improve that condition. And fibromyalgia. It's like a little spider's web, isn't it, going off. So celiac disease group survey showed that 9% of the people with celiac disease had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And 30% of them were told they had irritable bowel disease. They got fatigue, 
muscle and joint pain, GI symptoms, non-cardiac chest symptoms, and they were tested and shown to have celiac. So celiac disease is not an allergy, it's not an intolerance, but it's a lifelong illness. If you keep eating it, if you come to things correct. So there's got to be permanent withdrawal from the diet of all foods and drugs, which I shall come on to later, containing minute, even a minute amount of gluten. And compliance with the diet is crucial for your long-term health. Think of the Ashkenazi Jew man at 100, son of 70. They were obviously having a fine time. Wheat flour can be used as a cheap extender in many foods, and you wouldn't expect wheat. You wouldn't make yogurt at home and put flour in it, would you? It thickens itself. And corn tacos, some are just corn, that's fine, but others have got flour in, it's an extender. I've even seen in a supermarket mashed potato and I picked it up thinking, well it's easier to boil a potato and mash it, and it had flour in it. Why? Flavoured crisp, licorice, I found a bag of licorice the other week that didn't have wheat in it, it's the first time. 30 years I've eaten licorice because all of it has wheat in it. Chocolates, ice cream could have maltodextrins in it, gravy bound, wine gums, gummy bears, <coughs> many drugs and sweets and patients have got to have detailed counselling. Think of that poor man who'd been celiac and was having cornflakes every day and thought he was off wheat but was being drip fed all the time. So you've got to teach people, you need time with them. Ten minutes in a doctor's surgery isn't long enough. You've got to sit and explain it properly so they understand what foods they can eat safely. And you've got to address the nutritional deficiencies. So there am I, but there's nothing in here I can eat anymore. It was distressing. You know, I taught home economics, and I knew about food, but even I was distressed because it was so hard to change. <coughs> so there's free from food, there's crumbles, there's true free, there's wheat and dairy free .com. So there's more choice, but you have to be astute because some of them have got lots of additives and trans fats and sugars in, so you have to use your wits. So food, glorious food, we've got fish, white, oily shellfish, meat, red meat, poultry, game, eggs from hens, ducks and quail. I said to Graham last night, I've never seen a turkey egg. Why have I never? I don't know what that is. How am I doing for time? I'm running out. Root vegetables, red, green leafy veg, pulses, peas, beans, lentils, gourds, pumpkins, acorn squash, peanut squash, nuts and seeds, and then the non-gluten grains, rice, corn, millet, buckwheat, quinoa, and tubers like tapioca, arrowroot, chufa. So we're not going to starve. There's a lot of other food to live on. And the names for wheat, modified starch, if it says modified potato starch and modified tapioca starch, you're fine. But if it just says modified starch, there's a danger it's wheat. Dextrins, maltodextrins, wheat flour, rust, bran, semolina, couscous, soy sauce, lard, starch, modified starch, gelatinized starch, wheat, wheat germ oil, wheat germ, wheat glucose syrup. I bought some fudge the other week for my friend's two kids and I read it when I got home and there's wheat glucose syrup in it and it's made in Patagonia mm -hmm. you know if you make fudge you don't put wheat in it normally Satan somebody offered me a chop looking thing in Philadelphia once 
and it was made with gluten meat substitute. And I said, are you trying to kill me? Because it wouldn't do a celiac any good at all. Sausages have got rust skin. You have to buy, you know, gluten-free ones. Some lemonade, thickening, cereal filler, dried wheat gluten, hydrolyzed plant and vegetable protein, monosodium glutamate, textured vegetable protein, malt vinegar, some baking powder, some gravy brownie. So you have to know this up here when you're buying food and make sure you're not getting all this infiltrated wheat into you. So edible non-gluten grains, brown and white rice, rice cakes, rice noodles, rice pasta, tamari sauce made with rice, corn tortilla and tacos, corn pasta, polenta, corn crisp breads, corn flour to thicken sauces, lentil flour, poppadoms, lentil pasta, bombay mix, <coughs> and waitrose are doing a delugo fresh chickpea pasta. Genius bread made with rice, potato and tapioca flour. Antoinette Savile <coughs> makes rice and cornbread. G Free Foods in Honiton make rice and quinoa bread. And there's Dove's Farm flowers. Food for Life in America make the beautiful rice breads. And there's wheat and dairy free. And you can also get at specialist shops chestnut, banana flowers, chufa and arrowroot. So you can thicken things with corn flour and arrowroot. So ideal breakfast, scrambled eggs, corn crackers and hummus, millet porridge and berries, potato cakes, baked beans, yogurt, stewed berries, buckwheat crackers, fruit smoothies, banana yogurt ice cream, um, corn tacos for lunch with hummus and crudities, tuna and avocado salad, leek and mango risotto, chickpea and spinach curry, almond and chestnut loaf. You're not going to starve. And you've got lots of alternatives. The more different foods you eat, the more nutrients going to eat, the healthier you're going to be. High tea, avocado and egg, chopped up egg. Instead of putting mayonnaise in it, chop up an avocado with some lemon juice and your it's a Spanish omelette, salmon salad, you know, just lots of different things you can eat. And snack on nuts and seeds and sunflower and pumpkin seeds, dainty figs, raisins and sultanas, savoury popcorn, poppadoms I'd have died without poppadoms, lentil flour. And some prawn crackers are made with tapioca flour. So happiness is a good bank account, a good cook, and a good <laughs> digestion. And I've put recipes together. The one area that worries me the most is the gluten-free drugs. I had a bad tooth the other week, so I had to have antibiotics. And it took me 11 chemists before I found an antibiotic without eating it. One chemist said to me, it's got maize in it, is maize wheat. And I thought, you ought to know. <laughs> so we've got a lot out there. The doctors and the pharmacists are not trained in what are called excipients, which bind tablets together. And one in seven people are in hospital because of a bad reaction to a drug, possibly the gluten and the lactose. So you have to check even your drugs. Bristol Laboratories make a paracetamol that's wheat free. So you have to know. And finally, if all the tests are negative but you feel better on a wheat exclusion diet, then the choice is yours. But you really, if it's celiac disease, you really need to get So you've got other grains rye and oats and barley, which some people tolerate, but they ought to be tested properly. So remember, variety is the spice of life and moderation in all things. And I'm going to swish past the tests. That's the main one people look at, anti-glide and antibodies. When gluten is placed in a petri dish with tissue from human internal organs, the gluten damages the tissue. So they, they test the blood against the gliadin. And the 
other test that they use is the um, gold standard biopsy, an endoscopy, with a flexible tube that they put down you under anaesthetic till it gets into the duodenum and they pinch a few villi and haul it out again. And that's the gold standard test. But they give you antibiotics. Now what if the antibiotics have got wheat in? I hope they don't. So, you know, there are various ways of getting tested. But the other thing that worries me to end on is that not everybody is true celiac. There are some people who seem to be sensitive to wheat. Now, we don't know whether it's the gluten, the phytic acid, the phytoestrogens, the xenoestrogens from the pesticides it's in, the hormones that are put spliced into the genome, the chemicals that are in the genome. So, you know, some people seem to react to wheat. It makes them bloat more. Now, whether that's the beginning of a celiac disease, we don't know. So there needs to be far more research. And I mentioned citric acid, which attracts calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc, and bonds form, which are resistant to human digestion. So you lose the minerals you're eating. So find a doctor who will listen and test you. And then you go through the eliminate the gliadin and gluten, avoid dairy initially, correct nutritional deficiencies, treat the associated conditions, eliminate the food allergens, or if you've got those as well, or food intolerances, and heal the gut membrane. That would involve acidophilus, slippery, and L-glutamine from a non-wheat source. So it's a whole new world out there. If you've been feeling absolutely awful and ill for so long, and it's celiac disease, and you come off the gluten, it's like the lady said. It's like coming out of a thick fog into a clear blue sky. And it takes some perseverance. But the difference between feeling deathly ill and exhausted and in pain all the time to being able to run up a hill, leap a five-bar gate, you know, who wants to feel ill if you can feel well? Life's too short. So try. All truth passes through three stages. First it's ridiculed, then it's opposed, and then it's accepted as being self-evident. And everything you take for granted today was once revolutionary. The man who said light bulbs will never make it. was totally wrong. <laughs> And nothing becomes real until you experience it. My head must use to say there's no failure except in ceasing to try. And Michael Murray says it's crazy not to care about how you treat your body. It's the only one you've got to get. And we've just buried Elizabeth at 105. And she was gardening till she was 102. She was making apple pies and giving three quarters to the old folk. Mm -hmm. And she used a walking stick. And she ate raspberries like children eat Smarties. So, you know, there's a lovely book here called The Blue Zone. There's also a book here called Dangerous Grains by James Braley. Where is it? There he is. And I've done the handouts. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave them there. I did about 16, so I don't know how many people will come. Mm. So I hope that, and there's some of my cards there. So I hope that's answered questions. And yeah. thank you to the Nutri Center, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know whether anybody wants to fire a question. Are you going to unplug me? <laughs> Two questions, if you want. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.